Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us for the second panel. Uh, as I was preparing for this um, and looking through the qualifications of the uh, practitioners and policymakers, I was really struck that uh, many of them could have easily appeared on the first panel, that they are also uh, people with long and impressive research bios, including on the measurement of inequality. Um, but quite a number of them are also in positions where they're um, guiding and making decisions about what their institutions should do. Um, I'm going to introduce them very briefly, and then maybe while I'm introducing you, I'm going to tell you that the first question I'm going to pose to the panel is, are you in favor of a greater institutionalized measurement of poverty, keeping in mind Nancy's analogy of the uh, dollar-a-day poverty line, that whether internationally or within your institution there should be a greater formalized measurement of some form of inequality? If so, do you have a preferred indicator? And uh, if your organization has uh, begun work in this regard or indeed has adopted one, I'd like to hear about that. That's sort of the outline of the entire panel, so we won't take all the answers all at once, but those are the questions that I'm going to be asking. Um, to my immediate left is Andrew Berg. Andrew is the Assistant Director and Chief of the Development Macroeconomics Division in the Research Department at the World Bank. Um, excuse me, at the IMF. And uh, I know that, actually. He is the author of a 2011 staff discussion note, Inequality and Sustainable Growth, Two Sides of the Same Coin. I much prefer the title he put on a blog post, Warning, Inequality May Be Hazardous to Your Growth. Uh, and there's also a, a journal version of that, something about the journal process. Um, the journal title is What Makes Growth Sustained? So um, for me, the blog post is the way to go. Um, to his left is Santiago Levy. Uh, Santiago is, as many of you know, Vice President at the Inter-American Development Bank. He's the uh, former Director General of the Mexican Social Security Institute. And uh, Santiago, I've been told stories, I've never had discussed this with you personally, but that you not only designed um, Opportunidades Progresa, but insisted that there be impact evaluation. And then as a result of that, I think many people know this story better than I do, it was emulated around the world and was one of the stories that really drove the impact evaluation movement. So it's an important legacy, and we're delighted to have you with us here today. Um, Richard Morgan is um, senior advisor on the post-2015 development agenda at UNICEF. He was previously director of policy and practice at UNICEF's headquarters. He spent more than 20 years um, working in Africa. I was speaking with Richard and his colleague earlier today, and coming out of the UN's um, consultation process, specifically on inequality. There are more than 6,000 people who participated in that process, and they have now created something called the Addressing Inequalities Network Alliance, bringing those 6,000 people together. So, Richard, I'm delighted to have you um, with us here today. Uh, Paul O'Brien is Vice President of Policy and Campaigns at Oxfam America, and previously spent five years in Afghanistan, where he counseled senior he was counseled the senior economic advisor. He was also a senior international advisor to the Af Afghan government. And finally, Jaime Sav Savidra, thank you, Nancy, is acting VP at the World Bank's Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Network and was previously director of the bank's Poverty Reduction and Equity Department. So as I said, we have people who have, um, uh, as core parts of their responsibilities been involved in questions of whether and how to measure inequality. I want to throw it open to the panel then, but initially, who here thinks there should be more formal measurement of inequality in an institutionalized sense? One, two, just two. Measurement. 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 Three, four. A little uncertainty there from um, from Jaime at the end, so he's, he doesn't want to go cross cross Martin. I think. Uh, um, who would like to go first? And 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 oh, who has a preferred measure? We've heard about a variety of measures today. Okay, Richard, what's your preferred measure and why? Um, about three years ago, we started to look at the database on child mortality, and we found that even among the countries that had made rapid progress in reducing child mortality, only a third of them had actually succeeded in reducing the gaps between child deaths in the richest uh, quintile of families and the poorest. So that led us to think that, uh, as was said during the first panel, um, simply looking at the averages is not going to allow us to understand the problem. 
uh, of child deaths. And then we looked at other indicators like uh, child nutrition, underweight and stunting, found very similar patterns, uh, access to clean water and sanitation and so on. So we figured out we were missing a lot of the picture. So part of the institutionalization is using the household survey data we already have from mix and DHS surveys to actually perform and work with central statistics office to perform systematic disaggregation of available data on human development outcomes that correspond to, to the MDGs. For us, the two most powerful, um, you know, speaking from an institutional point of view, but I think for human development outcomes generally, uh, child deaths as the one, uh, which can be disaggregated in various ways, household wealth, urban rural, as was mentioned, gender, although there isn't uh, substantial differences between girls and boys, in fact, worse for boys, and then uh, uh, new, uh, child malnutrition, particularly stunting, which uh, we think is a very good predictor of, of future capabilities in life. I, I'd like to come back to that in a second round. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you would take those as, as proxies or just as examples of the kinds of things that could be done? We think these are ends of human development. We think uh, the, the measure of uh, development progress should be about people's lives and um, whether people survive, whether people grow in a healthy way. And then we come on to education, which is more, more complicated to, to measure and assess learning, but that should also be there in some shape or form. So those will be three, not just proxies, but also direct measures of success or failure in development progress. Paul, you get to go second because you put your hand up saying you had a preferred indicator. I like it. Um, yeah, I prefer the Palma, uh, and I'd like it modified into some kind of super Palma, which looks just at the 1%, um, but if I get to say why. Um, and I have to say I was a little, I was a little nonplussed by the, the first panel, although I found it fascinating, because I had on the hat, is this going to be a politically salient debate over the coming years? And if I listened to where the, the first set of panelists came at it, I, I, I was kind of wor worried. Um, civil society activists um, are asking the question, can we use this to build a different kind of discussion and a lot more power uh, for the poor? And I think if you took some of the, particularly some of the skepticism from the early panelists, there's no constituency for it, there's no philosophical foundation, Martin, you're wrong, there's no political economy analysis, I think that's wrong too, that will found it. Uh, James said, I don't think there's going to be a lot of agreement around a rel relative inequality target as a, as a rationale not to engage in a relative inequality discussion. So all of that got me kind of depressed, and I would like to lift at least my own spirits on this front. But I want to do it by starting, Lawrence, with a very quick anecdote, and anecdote which I think you will find useful. I started out many years ago in the rights world. My job was to try and help the UN and NGOs think about rights-based programming and I basically went around all these countries for years talking to them about what it meant to translate needs into rights. Now think your basic Monty Python show. No, they're not needs, they're rights and so on and this goes on and on. And, <laughs> and, then, and I realized after five or ten years of doing my own work that all the good programmers just kept on doing what they were doing anyway and basically ignored me. But when I showed up, they said, yes, Paul, they're right, it's fine. And the bad programmers learned the spin and didn't change anything they were doing. And that's precisely what's going to happen with the inequality discussion if we don't add a little bit more meat to it. People who've been thinking about measuring poverty, doing it in smart ways, engaging it, many of the folks on the first panel are going to keep doing what they're doing. And this so-called moment isn't actually going to deliver more political energy and vibe to it unless we do something that's more interesting. What I realized in the rights discussion way back when was that you could separate the, the wheat from the chaff when you stopped talking about rights victims, which people were working on in development already, they just called it something else, and started talking about rights perpetrators. That pretty much cleared a room when you were saying, okay, who's comfortable with this now? Let's start talking about who's to blame. The interesting discussion in inequality is going to be around elite capture and who's wealthy and how they're gaining and how we measure it. And if we can start to put measures in place that build a thoughtful, politically, as Nancy says, politically salient discussion around inequality and who's benefiting, 
then I think we could build towards something over the next couple of years that changes the equation, that builds that constituency. I know the UN asked a million people, but I can promise you they didn't ask them, let's take a vote. Would you like to see more money taken from the top 1% and given to the rest of us? And we all know what the answer would have been if they had asked that vote. So I have three levels of courage that I want to put to all of us in terms of how we go about measuring extreme wealth, political capture, and so on. I call it aggressive, moderate, and passive aggressive. Okay, the aggressive one, which my Oxford colleagues want to do, is they just want to go after extreme wealth per se. If you got two airplanes, you basically shouldn't. And there's no better proxy of extreme wealth than how much wealth you actually have, uh, uh, whether extreme wealth is bad than how much you actually have. There's just something wrong when you're earning more than 10 million a year. There's something wrong that the top 100 wealthiest people in the year earned two and a half times the global aid budget last year, $240 billion. Plain, straight up wrong, let's just go after it. The moderate one, which we folks at Oxfam America, because we still like to uh, uh, cultivate the American dream and at least understand that it's out there, is forms of political capture which say it's not how much wealth you have, it's what you buy with your wealth. It's okay to buy a football team, but it's not okay to buy a national football team because then you own the country. Um, it's okay to buy an airplane, but it's not okay to buy the law. And so let's start looking at measures that correlate wealth and politics. That starts to get really interesting. And can we get into how wealth feeds corruption and so on? The most passive aggressive, which it, knowing the system we live in and all the constraints we face is probably going to be the one that succeeds, is the one that never even declares its name, which is the transparency to accountability agenda, which of course is an inequality agenda, which of course is trying to democratize economic power and ultimately money, but it's never going to actually say that. It's just going to say, wouldn't it be great if we all had better information about who owns what? And in the end of the day, hopefully, because there's enough activists out there and there's enough new technology out there, that will become an inequality discussion. All I would say, it's like the private sector discussion, is let's not declare success if the transparency discussion takes off, because that's going to happen anyway. The really interesting debate for us is whether we start measuring political capture and elite capture on the one hand, or whether we try to shift the whole negotiating range and be a little bit more pres uh, progressive than the current president of the United States, who's already actually gotten pretty far out there, and go after elite wealth simply because it's wealth. And that's why I want an inequality measure, because I think it will force all of those kinds of discussions. And without it, we're going to spend all our time having a pretty, I don't think, non-added value discussion around what the, what the poor are going to get anyway. So, sorry, that's my rant. Paul, thank you for that, for that energizing rant. Um, Jaime, I see, I see you actually, I have a particular question for Jaime. Santiago, you'd also indicated you were ready to respond, but I, I, I think that much of what Paul said, I wonder if you can first describe to us what the bank's uh, current measure is, this focus on 40% that we've heard something about, and then also if you're able to talk about a bit of the political process around that, because I think that this manifesto that Paul has laid out something like that comes to play in the bank when they're making a decision about setting targets. And to the extent that you can give us some insight into that process, I think it would be very interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, happy to hear that you were the moderate because the table was moving <laughs> <laughs> while you were talking. So, I mean, thanks for that. So, um, but let me, so let me, um, I, I won't talk about the elite capture part, right? And why, why that might uh, require indicators of, of extreme uh, uh, inequality, and and we can talk later about if, if the problem is that extreme inequality or if the problem is the coexistence of that extreme inequality with the lack of a social contract, right? That allows the wealth, right, to be to be redistributed in in in, an, in 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 the in the right way. But let, let me leave that for the for a second intervention. So let me go to a much much more boring and less um, uh, and less ranting probably a uh, um, comment um, about how did we went about, um, how did we go about uh, coming up with these new uh, goals and targets for the bank? So uh, the, the bank has established uh, um, that its mission endorsed by the uh, governors of its client countries that it's centered around two goals, right? It's sustainably reducing extreme poverty and promoting shared prosperity. Extreme poverty is what you already know, right? And, and MDG 1A. 
Um, and the message there is clear, right? Hunger, destitution must come to an end, right? And we can come later to the discussion if it's zero, if it's three, whatever. But the, 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 the signal on that one is, is clear. And the second, in the, in regarding this other, um, this other goal that was called at the end promoting shared prosperity, the question is how could we have um, a welfare goal that would be relevant uh, for both low-income countries and for middle-income countries, right? A, a goal that could also be expressed in a simple way, right? And I can discuss also the different candidates that we have that uh, theoretically were very good but were, were, were difficult to difficult to explain or that might not capture easily the imagination of people. So after a big discussion, we came up with this indicator of tracking growth in incomes of the bottom 40%, right? First of all, that's relatively simple to understand, right? Take the bottom 40% of the population, take the, what's the average growth and, uh, and, and what's the average and track that, track the growth of that number. And with that, um, we thought we, we we will start in giving the signal that the institutional mission is about reducing poverty. If we put everything together, everything together, that the mission is about reducing poverty, uh, has to be fostering growth because there's very difficult to have poverty reduction without growth, but also it's increasing equity, right? It's we need to monitor this this um, laser focus and monitoring what's happened to welfare of the less well off shows that improving averages is not enough, right? Just monitoring GDP or any average in every indicator is not enough, right? A focus on what's happening with welfare to the bottom of the distribution everywhere is needed. That is, that is the key point of that income growth of the bottom 40%. So what the, the signal that, that we're trying to give there is that progress is about a growing pie, but it's a growing pie that has to be better distributed. It's a growing part that has to be equitably distributed. Now. Some people said, well, but that's, an, again, another monitoring, monitoring, uh, monetary indicator, right? It's income growth. True. I mean, we're, we're, we're using as, a, as a, a, an indicator that we know that it is a crude indicator of wealth, a very, very crude indicator of wealth, right? But, I mean, it's easier, not easy, but easier to calculate than, than, other, in, than, than other indicators of, uh, of, of welfare. But the essence, at the end of the day, is giving the signal that averages are not enough. What matters is what happens with welfare of the, of the bottom, right? It's the, same, it's the same discussion that we have with the, with the $1 a day. People say, oh, but this is a monetary indicator. Well, of course, that is a monetary indicator, but when we talk about extreme poverty, we're talking about the that all the multiple dimensions of poverty. When we're talking about welfare of the less well-off, we're talking about all the dimensions right, that are, that, of, of welfare. Because if we, I mean, probably, I mean, and, and James is here, probably we'll be able to come up with a multidimensional indicator of the bottom 40%. But the point is that then I will have to explain what are the, the different dimensions? What are the weights of the, the, those dimensions? If I use the, these eight dimensions, why are we using these eight dimensions for all the countries? Some of the countries will say, well, but I mean, these eight dimensions are not the right ones here. It should be these other 10. Right, so I could get into all those discussions, right? And the point was, was okay, let's have something that is simple, but at the end, at the end of the day, in terms of what this means, in terms of, I mean, the, uh, what countries should do, right? Um, it, is, it is about the essence of poverty, is about the essence of, I mean, what's welfare of the less well off. So let me leave it there, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why we didn't choose an inequality indicator explicitly. Terrific. We will come back to you indeed. Um, Santiago, there's a lot on the table already. I'm going to leave it to you to address whatever piece of it you'd like. I do have a particular question for Andy, though. Um, so I'll pick up from the very initial statement from Nancy and, and try to bring sort of a policy perspective to the discussion. Um, from that angle, I think the debate about an individual measure is incomplete if we don't know talk as well about what policies we are planning to use to get to that particular indicator. It's not so important whether I'm gonna choose the palm indicator or the median, or I'm gonna choose this one or the other one. They all have their pros and cons. Uh, what concerns me a lot is that that discussion by itself is insufficient from the perspective of policy, and that you wanna assign a very clear discussion of what is it that the government is going to do at what policies and programs the government is going to do to bring about the reduction of inequality. 
uh, Latin America has experienced some reductions in inequality that arguably are not so desirable. Um, about half of the reduction in inequality that we've observed in the last decade has to do with the fact that wage differentials are narrowed and basically because the premium for skilled labor has come down relative to the premium for unskilled labor. And it's not the relative, it's the absolute return to skilled labor that has been coming down. So that brings your inequality indicator down and it doesn't do, it, it, it's, it's, it's not so clear that that is something that is gonna be desirable. So clearly by some measure, and I am one of those that think that the region is very unequal and that certainly inequality should be coming down, but that if we just focus on any individual number, we're not gonna be able to do it. What my concern is about focusing on individual number without a discussion about the policies that are behind that number mm -hmm. is that some of the stuff that Martin was talking about that I uh, agree with is that a lot of the incentives discussion associated with policies or programs is lost. And this is not a right wing point because I, I come from the opposite extreme. I come from, we certainly need a lot less inequality and we certainly need a lot less poverty but we need sustainable reductions in inequality and not every policy and every program that does it is actually welcome. So if you take a terms of trade shock and you take all the resources from a terms of trade shock and you turn around and you double or triple the size of your conditional cash transfer program, that will bring down a reduction in inequality by some measure. Um, it's not clear that that policy is as good as, let me do an income tax reform that closes loopholes and actually really brings down and uses the money for early child development or for improving the quality of schools and doing some of the things that also will bring about inequality. So uh, I'll close here at this point is, I think the discussion about the indicator is incomplete unless we accompany this discussion from a policy perspective. Uh, what are the programs and policies that we're gonna do? And those programs and policies have to be evaluated from various dimensions their fiscal implications, their incentives implications, and the medium term sustainability as to what they do along very important dimensions like participation rates, formal informal choices, impact on savings and things like that. If we want sustainable permanent reductions of inequality, uh, we need to think about the policies that are gonna deliver that and then some numbers that accompany that. But the number by itself, I think would be incomplete. That's my. And Santiago, thanks very much. When we come back to you, I do want to hear to the extent that you're able to share with us what, if anything, is going on within the IADB. But um, first, Andy, we had a chat to, chance to chat beforehand, so this question's not exactly out of the blue, but given your research about the um, risks that uh, high and rising inequality pose to growth, and given the IMF's core mission of promoting um, stable growth, um, to what extent is inequality coming into the country dialogues? Um, are there particular indicators that are being used? And also, if you, if you have a particular indicator that you like more than others, um, I'd be interested in hearing that as well. Thank you. First, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's an honor, and it's a, it's a dauntingly uh, impressive set of uh, panelists. Uh, no one else seemed to have to say this, but uh, I suppose that one difference between the IMF and the World Bank is it's possible to speak for the IMF, and I am not uh, speaking for the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... Uh, that uh, you know, maybe goes without saying. So uh, I think, uh, let, me, let me start back and say that I do think inequality is different from, uh, from growth and poverty. So I, I, kinda, I, I thought a lot of what Martin said and others have, have since re repeated Santiago is exactly right. But, but there's another sense in which inequality is more, more interesting uh, than, than poverty at least. When we, when we think about poverty and we talk about poverty, certainly at the IMF, the instinct or the, the, the habit and, and, and the practice is to, is to largely say, well, okay, we have to have good programs to address poverty. That's not really our uh, job. Uh, uh, we could see what the bank thinks about that. But in, when we think about inequality, uh, we, we tend to think about much broader issues. We, anyone, all of us, I think, when we think about inequality, we think about broader issues, whether it's power structures and elite capture or it's trade policy and the role of globalization. Uh, or other, or, in the, or, or, or uh, computerization and its effects on relative wages, or the wage premium. There's a bunch of much more, inter more interesting, but much broader kind of structural and economic questions that come up. And so I think the inequality discussion is, uh, is hopefully enriching in that way. Logically, in a sense, I think it's true. It's a corollary of thinking about growth and thinking about poverty. So this is more of a uh, rhetorical point maybe than a, than a uh, 
a, a logical uh, one, but I still think it's, we, we certainly have seen it today. Uh, at the fund, um, actually, I'd like to, you know, when I think about what we do at the fund, partly I want to associate myself with what I guess Anisha said, asked, which is, what does any of this matter for policy? And, and, and I didn't hear an answer on the first panel. I'm afraid I don't really have an answer either. But, but there are elements of it in the discussion, and I want to I come back to that. What, what I think uh, at, the, at, the, at the fund, I don't think, one reason I was sort of hesitant to, to answer that we, there needs to be a formalization of, of a new target is that I, I do think it's inescapable that, that, power, that inequality, because it's so broader, is, is very complex, and it's very hard to come up with one or a small number of measures that are uniformly interesting. In a place like the U.S., to, to look at the top 10% misses the drama of the last 30 or 40 years, as many have convincingly argued. On the other hand, there may be places where, where it really is all, or many, there are surely many places where it really is more about the bottom 40% and the top 10% and, and the sets of dynamics that, that, that go on there. And, and, and so I'm not really in favor of an indicator. I think we need, we need more data. It's really boring for a researcher to say we need more, more data, but we do. Uh, data is a public good. As was said, there's been great work done with PopCalNet and other databases and other work, but, but we need, uh, we, we have a remarkably small amount. So at the fund, uh, there is a, there, uh, I think there's a lot of openness and, and interest in the question. It comes partly from the top, I think. It comes partly from staff uh, uh, who go out and, 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 and talk to people in, in countries and, and, and get questions. I think as much as anything, and, and it certainly then it comes from circumstances in the world, and including mainly in, in our clients. It's not that when uh, we go on our U.S. Article Four, we're you know bombarded with questions about inequality, but but in other contexts, uh, we we do run across that the authorities have questions. They they want to know you know if we're advising on various policies, uh, uh, what's it going to mean for inequality? What's it going to mean for growth? Now, going back to this issue that there's no one measure. I would say that much of the concern is not really about inequality per se that we observe in our clients, including I mostly work in, the poor, in low income countries, IDA eligible type countries, but I think it's certainly true in emerging markets. It's mostly uh, what we call at the fund the jobs and growth agenda. It, people want good jobs, they want, you know, the people are worried kind of about middle class, uh, and manufacturing jobs, sustainability of growth, and a bunch of things that are related to inequality but are not the same. So if you I, don't, I actually don't want to name countries, but there are not many countries where they say, okay, help us reduce inequality. But there are many where they say, help us make sure that growth is pro-poor in some sense they have in mind. So that brings me to, I guess, my last point for now. I can't remember if I've answered the question. But, but uh, we don't have a lot of tools. We know very little. I think a key, uh, a key issue that, that we've been working on a bit recently in, in some broad ways is, is, is the role of fiscal policy. And I, so I really think if there's one measure that I find most interesting in the first panel, it, it's, it's uh, Norris. Because I think... It's amazing how many macro papers there are. I mean, macro, I mean, I'm a macroeconomist, and just how many macroeconomic papers don't even mention whether they're talking about net or you know inequality, market inequality, or or after tax and subsidy inequality, and it's a huge difference. All this, many of the political economy stories about the importance of inequality have to do with net inequality or you know after tax inequality. On, on the other hand, many of the issues with things like globalization or computerization have to do with gross inequality and so on. So I think, and we don't, and one thing that is a policy instrument is fiscal policy which we don't know much about. It's really hard to know outside the OECD and outside NORA's six countries or whatever they are. You have more now, I know, but I'm plugging you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but outside of those countries, it's not clear what, what governments do for, for, for inequality or transfers. Uh, and and I, I do think that's very important. But to finally to circle around, I think, it, I think staff in the fund, you know, it's easier for us to write chap it's easy for us to write chapters in regional economic outlooks about growth and inequality in Africa and things like that, or growth in poverty. What's much harder is when country, when the authorities say, well, you know, tell us something we can use. What can we do? We have very little idea, and I think we're trying to work on that. Uh, but to give you an example of the, the difficulties, you know, we wrote this paper saying that inequality is bad for sustainability of growth if you just look across the pattern of, uh, of history, of post-war history. But, but one of the theor reasons people, people argue that inequality is bad for growth at least there are some academic papers along these lines, is that unequal countries do stuff with fiscal policy and other policies to try and make themselves more equal, and that's bad for growth. It's the fiscal channel, as, as they say. 
And it, it, I'm not saying that's true, but if that is the reason inequality is bad for growth, then the policy conclusion is very tricky, or it's obvious. It's, you know, you shouldn't, you, you should, you should relax. Uh, and we're trying to work on that now, but there isn't much data. That comes back to where I'm saying uh, 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 we have to work, we have to make more data. So, so I think there's a, really a, a problem where the rubber meets the road for actual policymakers about this problem, at least, and certainly at the sort of macro kind of level. Um, Richard, you and I were chatting beforehand a bit about the um, constituencies, and Andrew has touched on that in terms of saying that within the IMF, some of it's coming from the top, some is from staff, and some is from questions in the country consultations. But you were talking internationally, and you mentioned something that was interesting to me, given Nora's leading role in this, that within the UN system, to the extent that there is a national constituency, it's coming from Latin America. Can you say anything more about that? Well, I didn't really want to talk about the uh, intergovernmental politics of, of the UN. Um, I, I would rather talk about um, what I perceive as sort of a situation of ships passing in the night a little bit here. I mean, if there's an outlier, I'm sure Paul is an outlier in, in one sense, and maybe I am in the other, because when, for example, and I understand I've read Andrew's terrific work uh, on this, but inequality may be hazardous to your growth, and I immediately say, yes, of course, if you're a young child, if you're a two-year-old or even a five-year-old, inequality is certainly hazardous to your growth. And there's plenty of evidence uh, to support that, not least from the U.S. and on the difference that early childhood investment programs can make. Uh, Jim Heckman's article in the New York Times Sunday Review um, yesterday, fantastic um, um, overview of that. Um, I was also grappling with this concept of equality of opportunity because I'm not sure what it exactly means and how it differs or is completely distinct from equality of outcomes. I mean, if you're born into a poor, deprived, dysfunctional family, uh, you're a young child, are you then going to suffer from the mistakes or failures of your parents or the failures of society that condemn your parents to failure, discrimination, injustice, whatever it is, uh, exclusion, and so on. Uh, where does the equality of opportunity come in? Is it school? Or what if school itself is unequalizing? Um, plenty of evidence that schools reinforce pre-existing inequalities among children. So where do they get the equality of opportunity? Do they wait till they're 18 when they've been in prison or been dealing drugs on the streets? I, I don't know. So I'm not clear where the equality of opportunity is coming in because so much of the evidence is, if I understand it, that the circumstances into which you are born, the family, social, uh, cultural circumstances into which you are born have a predominant impact on your life opportunities. So how do you get to the equality of opportunity? Um, so, yeah, that's why I think we're very interested in Alongside the debate on measures of um, economic inequality, uh, looking at human development and human outcome type inequalities uh, as well. Thanks very much. Uh, Santiago. No, I, I want to take on the point about this constituency for inequality. And again, this is a very landmark in perspective. I, I think what Rebecca said before, at least in Latin America, is very true there is a growing intolerance towards inequality. It is expressed in the Congresses. It is expressed, you know, the demonstrations within Brazil, the demonstrations we've seen in various countries. And in general, the thrust is societies recognize that just eliminating extreme poverty is not enough. And, and, and if you read the, what, what presidents and what sort of candidates and are saying, they're saying more than we're just going to eliminate extreme poverty and we're going to make sure there's no hunger. Um, and they're responding to some constituency. It's perhaps very difficult to pinpoint it as exactly this people or that people, but if you admit this very subjective judgment, it does float in the atmosphere that people want less inequality, they want fairer societies, they want more equality. And from that perspective, and to come back to the first panel, I think the difference between goal versus indicator matters a lot. I, I, I agree with Martin that we probably don't know enough to set this as a goal and we don't want to set it as a goal. That said, if the UN put in some sort of indicators, four or five, you know, you know, but some reasonable number, 
and just simply listed across countries and gave it as a reference for other countries and said, look, in this country, in our country, the top 1% take so much of the income and the top 10% take so much. You know, we don't know exactly we should be less, but just having those numbers available for the public discussion, as long as they're seriously calculated, um, matters. So that helps. And then, of course, and I just go back to my other point, the discussion about, okay, what do we do about it and what policies and programs would we implement matters as much. But, but to close the point, is there a constituency, at least in my region, yes. Um, Santiago, I want to um, ask you if you can talk about what's going on inside the IADD. We heard a bit from Andy and a bit from um, uh, Jaime about the World Bank. And given that there is particular concern in Latin America, where does your institution stand in terms of this process? So, so, so let me do what Andy did, which is I'm not speaking for the IDB. <laughs> Um, and I can't speak for the IDB, and so I don't want to say that this is what my institution is doing. But broadly, we were very concerned because we see in the region in particular a huge effort over the last decade about a proliferation of many social programs, some well designed, some not so well designed, some patently badly designed, all justified on this is good for inequality. And what we're beginning to see and there's some important impact evaluations coming out of this and there's some important research accumulating for various countries, is that some of these programs are negatively affecting participation rates, are negatively affecting formal informal choices, are negatively affecting productivity, and that therefore the discussion about policies is not academic. It is really central in a region that for 10 years has made a huge effort in terms of, if you look at indicators of social spending, pretty much across the board they've increased. So the concern at the bank is not so much whether we take an indicator or not, like the 40%. I, we have nothing against it. It's trying to understand the policies that are bringing about these outcomes. And then not saying not do it, but what really could be done that achieves the equality objective that you're pursuing, but it doesn't pay this very high side cost in terms of you know, informality, productivity, participation rates, erosion of the tax base, and other social behavior that you certainly don't want to promote over the medium term, but you do want to promote equality. You do want to, you know, sustainable uh, poverty reduction. And, and that's where, I guess, if I speak for my colleagues at the bank, and myself, so that's where the research and that's where the concern is. And it has to do with quality of education, early child development, and very, very importantly, functioning of labor markets. Thanks very much. Jaime, did you indicate you want to speak? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, 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 w I want to react to the issue of, of growth, right? And, and it's growth in one extreme or inequality of outcomes in the other extreme. And what's, what's the flavor level of the discussion there? And when, when, when we have the discussion of is inequality bad for growth, I would like to think of why don't we think of this is inequality bad for growth in welfare of the poor, right? Which is a slightly different statement, right? Maybe econometrically it's not that different, but in terms of what's the influence in terms of the debate, it is a bit different, right? Because then that gives the flavor that we are not about growth that is sustained, growth that is sustainable, growth that is in inclusive. It's like growth with adjectives. No, but it's a, growth is a means to an end at the, at, the, at the end of the day, right? So if there is growth, if, which is critical for poverty reduction, is because we, we need that because we care about welfare of the, of the less well off. Now, Inequality is absolutely critical. And I think the point that um, Santiago was making, let's distinguish between what is the thi things that we need to monitor and things that we could have as goals, right? And of course we need to monitor, and we do, and all the people here and in the bank and in the fund, we, and the, in the IDB, we do monitor the, different, the multiplicity of indicators of, of, of inequality. And I mean, there are many reasons why there is a lot of work in the different institutions trying to address inequality across genders, inequality in terms of differences in access to basic social services, et cetera. There are many reasons we do that. Inequality is morally unacceptable and it's a symptom of a broken social contract. Inequality can lead to social conflict, conflict and instability that imply less welfare for everyone. Inequality is a, a, a reflection that many people does not have the same chances in life. Right, inequality at the end of the day is a reflection of inequality of, oppor of opportunity. So at the end of the day, I mean, it is an absolute, uh, absolutely critical development challenge. The only reason why we were thinking, should we use inequality as a goal, right, inequality of any indicator of inequality of outcome as, as a goal? 
And the point is that we preferred an indicator that was an income, income or any measure of income growth of the less well-off because it's an indicator that is unambiguously, unambiguously desirable in any country, in any circumstances, in any point in time. It doesn't matter the size of the country. It doesn't matter the level of development of the country. It doesn't matter the point of the economic cycle. You do care about that. You do care about increasing the incomes of the, of the less well-off. If you say, no, but I, in addition to that, I also care my goal is inequality, then we could be ranking favorably a situation in which incomes of everyone are rising very low, very little, but maybe those at the bottom a little bit less, a little bit more, a little bit less bad, right? So like Egypt today, right? The average growth is one is 0.5%, but the, le the bottom 40 is doing 1%. Right? Or would be India in the times of the uh, Indian rate of growth, right? Very low, not necessarily increasing inequality, but very low improving welfare. And we were saying that would be a better situation than China during the period in which there was a huge and dramatic increase, a reduction in poverty, but an increase in inequality. Or what's happening in Indonesia today, massive reduction in poverty, but an increase in inequality. So the point is that, um, Reducing inequality is a very valid development goal, um, and, and obviously, in the medium and long run, there is no country who has graduated to a high income level with high levels of inequality, right? If you just plot, that's something that I mean, Martin has written a lot about, just plot inequality and income level, it's roughly, I mean, the, high, the rich countries are, on average, less unequal, right? So that will have to happen, right? But, but a reduction in inequality by itself does not imply an improvement in welfare of the less well-off at all moments in time. So let, let me leave it there at this point. I mean, thank you very much. Um, Andy. So, you know, we find among countries we work with that often there is an independent interest in, in, in even mean per capita, in per capita income growth. I mean, countries have a developmental objective, or the authorities we work with, I should say, often have a developmental objective. You know, they have a, some of them maybe have a long perspective. They want to be a, a rich country. Now, maybe it's elite capture or something like that. that it's hard to say. We, we're, we are all captured by our constituencies one way or the other, I suppose. Uh, but but, but it's, I think, on the whole, I think there's an element of, of validity to that objective. So I don't think it's all about, it's not all about the bottom 40%, mm -hmm. especially in countries where, you know, m almost everyone is poor. And so, and so it's very hard, like in a country, you know, in, in Malawi, it's, it's not clear that you really want, it's useful to pull out the bottom 40% from the next 30, who are also... I don't know, two or three dollars a day, you know, or maybe that's, I'm exaggerating actually, you know, the, and so, and so I think the circumstances, it's lower. Yeah. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so, so I think, it, I think circumstances uh, uh, matter. I do think uh, one of the reasons we, we, we work on the stuff we worked on is because we did want to move a little bit away from we, the, my, my, myself, my co-authors wanted to move a little bit away from the kind of dollar and cray, uh, 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 consensus, which was so dominant, I think, 10 years ago. I mean, the paper, Growth is Good for the Poor, which I, I still think is a, it's a very good paper, which pointed out that on the whole, and I don't think Martin likes this paper, we discussed it once, but, but anyway, it points out that on the whole, over long periods of time, the growth, well, it doesn't say that, but growth in the, in the income of the bottom 20% is pretty much one for one with growth of median, mean income. And, 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 and actually, I did some work myself once, look, show, and I, for Africa, noticing that if you look at short periods of time, like five years or less, that's not true at all. It, there's really no relationship between growth of the poor and growth of the mean. So you'd sort of say it's all about inequality it's, or, or distribution. It's not really about the mean. But the longer you go between spells in that data, and if you get out to 20 years, it starts to look like really what matters for the poor is having the whole country grow. Now, I mentioned this to Martin, and he said, no, you know, inequality trends too. And I had another look at the data, and time moved on, and, and he was right, which is that I think so. I think one thing, one reason we are where we are now, we at the fund or, or all of us, is that is that facts have changed. Uh, in the '70s, you know, there weren't a lot of countries with growing trends in inequality. Latin America was was high, higher than now, I guess. And but 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 uh, on the whole, you know, the U.S. rich countries were, were very equal. And so the fact that there have been great trends in inequality in China and the U.S. Uh, is, is is really what's driving uh, this debate, and it's an important debate. Uh, uh, I will 
I have one more point, but I'm sure I'll have a chance to come back. Um, Paul, I'm going to give you the last word or maybe rant before we go to the floor, but it has to be shorter than the first one. Okay. Well, that's going to be hard because I do speak for all of civil society everywhere. <laughs> we had a meeting. They nominated me. <laughs> Jenny, is it true? <laughs> um, so, no, uh, how do you get civil society more engaged on this? And I do think we have a political salience challenge because even with all the compelling arguments I've heard, the tra translating that into something that's going to mobilize us to really fight for the issues we care about. I, 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 there are arguments to be made that we haven't exhausted what we can say on behalf of people who are on the wrong end of justice and wrong end of e economic equations. Oxfam's doing a lot of work right now about the working poor in this country. We released a port around Labor Day. We're hosting a film in a couple of weeks talking about how hard it is to, in the United States uh, just to stay where you are as you watch uh, yourself falling further and further behind. But what we have found as we've gone out and done this research and talked to people is that there is this powerful sense that not everyone is playing by the same rules. And they want the rules named. And they want to know that the measures we're taking and the research we're doing is going to unpack and then ultimately build a broader political dis discussion around making those rules more fair. So just a couple of specifics, Lawrence, and, I, and I'll break off. What might be specifics around how we go after what I'm calling elite capture um, and do research that will help make the rules a little bit more fair in the eyes of those on the wrong end of the equation. There's so much work in the tax space now. Communities in wealthy, uh, wealthy parts of cities around the world that pay almost zero taxes. Forbes Park in the Philippines, Wazir Akbar Khan, and where I used to live in Afghanistan, Muthega, and so on. People want that broken down. People are paying, it's not redistributive taxes, they're paying literally nothing. Um, tax havens um, and all of the work that's going on around that. Um, and I think there's some really interesting work to be done if you go after the true, uh, true elite wealth on whether you compare them vertically within their own countries or horizontally with each other. Because frankly, they're all obsessed on comparing themselves with each other and how well they're doing. And they're, I, we do recognize as a campaigning organization that you make the most traction when you don't completely alienate some of the folks that you need to change along the way. We need elites to see um, a potential solution of which they can be a part, which is why Andy's 10% may be genius, because everyone in this room is kind of comfortable if you say we're probably in the top 20%, or maybe some of us are in the top 10%, and we can all start pointing at the 0.1%. Maybe we're in the top 2%. Somebody yeah. said earlier on, none of us are in it. Right. No, well, even in this country. How do you create a number when you start talking about wealth that garners enough of a powerful constituency in the bank and the UN and the US government where everybody feels, yeah, let's go after this because it's not me. Thank you, That's Paul. That's my closing comments. Um, I'm, I'm going to open up the floor, but first I'm going to step out of my role as chair and, and venture of you, um, as you know, I'm not an economist. I am a communications, a policy communications expert, and I've been thinking a lot about the median, and I want to recommend it to you, Paul, for two reasons. The first is that when we talk about inequality, the people who are at the bottom of the distribution have, among other things, poor educations and limited analytic ability. They are not going to get the genie, and they are not going to get the palma. We need to have a number that they can understand, and the median is something that they can get. And the other thing is, it's sort of the opposite reason is it doesn't sound leftist. You know, when you say, you know, we are the one, we're, we're the 99%, that sounds leftist. When you say we're concerned about the median, it embodies a lot of progressive views, but it's hard to imagine people on the right saying, well, we think the median ought to be lower. You just can't imagine that happening. So I think that it's a good ally building thing to focus on. So with that editorial comment aside, I'm just going to do one round of questions. Uh, I want to get as many voices as possible, and therefore I want them to be as brief as possible, and then I'll give the panel one opportunity to respond to whatever they wish. Um, we've got some mics in the back. We all would just rather go home. There are no questions or comments. One lady here. Please do identify yourself. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Rosanna Martinelli from the Organization of American States. I have a quick question with regards of all of these uh, reflections on the technical development of indicators. 
and the context, as we read the context today of a growth without employment or with challenges on employment and employment being a variable that can uh, succeed in reducing inequalities. How do you read or how can this, all these debate on indicators um, feed into the policy of governments and the leveraging of the momentum of the MD MDGs debate to um, have a more, not only pro-growth agenda, but more of a pro-jobs agenda or an alternative to the challenges posed by the employment issue in the region? Thank you very much. Anybody else? We've exhausted you. Casey Dunning. Casey Dunning with the Center for American Progress. Um, and just as a disclosure, I worked with um, um, John Podesta on the panel's report, so I'm mildly partial to it myself. Um, but I wanted to push you, um, um, Santiago, a little more on the policy piece as it relates to in, um, inequality, because I um, completely agree, but then if we if we push farther and, and think about how to actually have that in the post-2015 agenda and how to um, goalize it, that's where it kind of um, falls apart, in, in my opinion. So I wanted um, to get your thoughts on that. Uh, Nancy Wurzel. Mike is coming. Um, some years ago, um, I did, and, and many others, actually worked on social mobility, and, and in fact, the newest LAC report from the World Bank focuses on the middle class and social mobility. And then there's inequality of wealth, which has not been very adequately measured for thinking about public data. So anybody that wants to say anything about these other measures that still concentrate on money, but add value, that would be welcome. And second question, if I may, is for Jaime. Could you Put the mic up, a little louder. Could you, um, do you have any thoughts on the median compared to the 40th percentile? Was there any discussion of the 50th rather than the 40th? And was there any discussion of a systematic comparison of the, f the I I income growth at the 40th percentile over time to, I don't know, income growth. You're, you're implying it uh, overall, but is that an intention that we could welcome of the World Bank to actually make that comparison, institutionalize it, build it into the, into the world development indicators, talk about it? James, did you have your hand up? If you pass the mic down, please. Yeah, just one, one minor point. Actually, it's the mean income of the lowest 40%, which is distinct from the income oh, at the 40th percentile. Total. In the total mean yes. of the people below. So it, but, it, the mean of the, of that but your point is, is, I think, really, really an important one. That is, what do we really know about these income standards and how they move over time and space? It's really interesting. And I talked to uh, a number of people. I really don't have a heck of a lot of ideas because people haven't focused on that. Focus on inequality, on poverty, but this space with median, and with the lowest, uh, you know, the mean income, the lowest forty percent. That's really where a lot of the action could be in, in tracing this over time. Uh, the other thing about wealth, I'm I'm with you on that. That's I mean, median versus mean on wealth. Uh, the, the just the crude indicators that Tony Shorks put together for his report are amazing, and consequently. I mean, I, I teach that stuff, and it's much more impressive to students in terms of inequality than the income inequality by such a wide margin. They all say, why don't we get more? In so much higher. So much higher, indeed. Okay. We have time for one more if there's interest. Um, if not, I think we'll just go down the line here maybe. Andy, you went last last time, so we'll start with you and just go down. And um, uh, once you take a minute or up to a couple of minutes for your final remarks. Okay, so one remark. I just want to come back to something that was said about how rich countries are all equal and, 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 and link it back to policy. Which of course, it's not, it's not true. Uh, the U.S. in particular uh, doesn't, doesn't look that much more equal than, than a lot of unequal countries. Yes, it's a little bit less than some in Latin America, but not by much anymore. In fact, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this speaks to this question of are we thinking about net or what we call net or market inequality? 
because a lot of the data sometimes sometimes the data is on net and, and and sometimes it's not and, and and it's very you know Germany and the U.S. don't look very different in market inequality, which was shocking to me. <laughs> I'd worked on this topic quite a bit, and that was shocking to me when I noticed that in the data. And another thing, which I should have known because there was a nice report out of the World Bank a few years ago that pointed out that the difference between Latin America and Europe is not in gross and in, in, not in market inequality. It's in the degree to which fiscal system produces more equal outcomes in Europe. So, so really, I think we have to uh, think hard about that set of issues. I liked Santiago's suggestion of having four or five or six, I don't know how many, indicators that should be agreed upon. And then, you know, they're not going to be available for most countries. Uh, and so it would, it would generate pressure to produce them. And that could affect, and if there's enough, you can span most of the space of issues, I think. You know, top 1% top or 0.1%, you need to get tax data for that, and that will speak to some set of issues. Uh, median, anything to do with percentiles, you need surveys, and you will speak to another set of issues. And, and I think uh, it struck me that it wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't, you don't want to have proliferation, but it would be nice to have some cross indicators. So you say uh, infant mortality in the bottom 40% or something like that. I don't see why uh, taking a couple and doing that wouldn't be a nice way of combining the concerns of many people in this, you know, people say it's really about poverty and, well, it's about inequality. Okay, so look at, look at, look at that cross-section. Mobility would be harder, but, you know, in some countries, like, like again, the U.S., I think that mobility is a more powerful set of issues in a way than, uh, than inequality per se, and, and uh, it would be nice if there were measures of that, but that's probably, probably one step too far for now. Uh, but but I, I think that's, that, that would be a useful outcome. Thank, thanks very much. Santiago. Thank you. So, so this is where I come down, I guess, I'm sort of a pragmatic and partly answer to the question. Uh, the first thing I would suggest, and I think the, the world would gain, is if a body like the United Nations said, as part of the post-2015 goals, we are going to measure inequality. We're not going to recommend a specific number, to, but we're going to measure inequality in a systematic way across countries, and maybe four or too many. Here are three numbers, the median, the Gini, and the top 1%. And even for countries for which there's no data for the top 1%, the political pressure to then, look, if the United Nations is measuring this in here and here and here, but it's not measuring it there, then Congresses react, newspapers react, the polity moves, and eventually something happens and maybe the data for that. So, so part one is, if the world could adopt, we will measure inequality as part of the goals looking forward from 2015 onwards, I think they'll be sensational. Then I think recent people can say, we don't fully understand the mechanisms by which inequality is hurtful, but in many, many circumstances, if not all, it is very negative for growth, aside from you know as extremes being unethical, and the world would gain by being less unequal. And I think that would be a great gain. And I think where the really, really difficult part comes in is what are the policies that work that will actually bring about the reduction in inequality? I think that discussion is very much country-specific, should be much more informed by policy, but there should also be some caveats by saying not everything that reduces inequality tomorrow morning is good. You've got to be careful because there are incentives and there are things that you've got to take into account. And then that discussion, or poverty, or the same for poverty. But if we would move that in, in the next round, I think we, we kick the ball ahead. That's where I come down. Thank you very much, Santiago. Richard. Thank you very much, and thanks uh, for having me. Um, I was going to end up with one thing and, and just refer to what to me feels like the tyranny of economic-based measures of inequality. But um, uh, Andrew saved, saved me. And he mentioned, uh, suggested child, looking at child mortality in the bottom 40%. Um, I relate this to um, what Jamie was saying before, looking for measures that are un un unambiguously desirable in any country at any time, which is that if you're in a poor family, you do not have to see your children die. That's un unambiguously good for, for any country at any time, or for any family, for any parent. So I'd like to add that as, as a non-economic measure of inequality. I think, Andrew, it's a great suggestion. Child mortality, I think, infant mortality um, uh, in the bottom of 40%. The, 
The other thing I think in terms of the discussion around policy that Santiago, I think, was very powerfully putting is that research analysis on the causes, the structural drivers of inequalities, whether in wealth and income or child mortality or child stunting, what, what are these structural drivers for a given society, or even for a given community? I've suggested that underappreciated are, are the role of various forms of discrimination and exclusion, social, cultural, legal, um, historical, and often intersecting and overlapping. We haven't mentioned, for example, the situation of persons with disabilities and their exclusion from labor markets, from education, and so on, as one example. We've mentioned gender, mentioned ethnicity, disability would be another one, and obviously those can uh, overlap and uh, reinforce each other. So I think part of looking at inequalities is not only the measurement, but also the analysis of the structural, the underlying causes, and then in turn having that guide policy interventions uh, uh, to be uh, specifically tailored to, to those drivers. Paul. So, um, Lawrence, I was intrigued by your last comment. I, the, median, the median measure may be where you get the most traction right now, but I don't believe it's where you're going to get the most traction a couple of years from now. As a new American, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in love with the fact that Americans are violently moderate about a lot of things. And I think the moral republic repugnance of extreme inequality, as many of us are experiencing it now, is going to build a different kind of political dialogue in this country going into the next set of elections where you will see the Republicans move into a deeply more creative space than they've been for a long time if they want to have any chance of engaging. I think that resource constraints are going to force a redistributive discussion whether we like it or not because it can't simply be growth. Um, and I, I, the one that I think is the most interesting variable is whether the enlightened self-interest of the private sector is going to drive all of us to have a discussion about fair rules. The smarter corporations are going to want better rules where uh, performance is rewarded by uh, profit. And you're seeing increasingly a whole bunch of private sector folks say, we want good, solid rules. And if that redistributes wealth, so be it, because we'll still win. If those three forces come together, moral, Republican, Repub <laughs> moral repugnance of extreme inequality, <laughs> that'll slip there. <laughs> it's not an oxymoron, you know. <laughs> don't, don't count um, on it. <laughs> resource constraints and some real leadership by the private sector, which will happen whether or not we harness them. Um, we could have a really interesting discussion about measuring inequality on the top end of the scale. And I frankly think that's where the most interesting work will happen. So, yeah. Paul, thank you. Jaime. Thank you very much. First, a, a point, um, just to, to clarify, one point of, on growth. I mean, it's clearly it's not a, it's, when we talk about growth or well, increasing wealth of the less well-off, we need growth, period. Right? So growth is critical in order to have growth of the bottom 40%. The, the only point is that it's not enough because the elasticities from growth to poverty reduction or from growth to growth, income growth of the bottom vary widely. Right, so that 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 shows that there is a space to have a, lar a larger elasticity in many in many countries. Second point is that on on the uh, this this is not about the 40th percentile, but it's the bottom 40, right? And yes, we we thought about comparing that to just average growth, but that will be an inequality indicator, which is something that we will monitor, right? But because of the reasons that I mentioned, that we wanted something that will be unambiguously good for South Sudan and for China and for Chile is that we that that was the reason why we went for just the income growth of the bottom of the bottom 40 but clearly um monitoring the equator would be extremely important and in terms of the discussion of the mdgs what one, one could do what uh santiago was was mentioned just monitoring the quality let's put it out that out there with all with the caveats that santiago was mentioning but the, my only problem is that we are not there yet in terms of the right inequality indicators in the developing world, the right in the quality indicators that will really show the, 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 the inequality that exists in terms of power, right? that exists in terms, in terms of uh, access to the possibility of influencing 
right, the political, the political process, will require having indicators of inequality and wealth, which we do not have, and the top 1%, which we don't have neither. Right? And just, just, just on that, even, even to have this indicator of shared prosperity, this indicator of shared prosperity is the income growth, so it requires to have two surveys, right? two relatively comparable surveys. Only if we, can cap we can calculate that only for 70 countries, right? And for a five-year period and with a lot of, I mean, with a lot of um, gymnastics that we have to do. So it's extremely difficult. Even when we said we have better household data, yeah, we have made a lot of improvement. But, we, I mean, the glass is half full, half empty, right? There are many, many low-income countries for which we don't have any data. Right? In the any statistics that I always use is in the case of Latin America, for instance, if you look at the last decade, you have on average eight, data, eight annual data points on average right, in Latin America. That number for Africa is two. Right? And those two observations in many cases are not comparable to each other because one was financed by DFID and the other by the, by, by, by the Swedes. And, so. uh, and then the, so hence, so that it will be the problem of an outcome indicator of inequality. I think we can move in terms of an, an inequality of opportunity right, <coughs> indicators that could be embedded in the different MDGs already, right, in which you can monitor not only uh, infant mortality or maternal mortality, but then monitor that for specific disadvantaged groups or for the bottom 40, whatever. And, but that's something that is, I, I think, is something that we could do and that will have an influence on policy relatively quick.